Now the next couple of strategies that are going to come up in this section are usually for budgets of um, anywhere up to a million pound, but typically from fifty thousand pound up to a million pound, and even upwards from there. If you have a smaller budget, so if you're maybe starting with less than fifty thousand pounds, some of these strategies can still be relevant. Um, it's just a case if you might not do them directly um, or just solely on your own. So, for example, if you're a property sourcer, or want to become a property sourcer, then look at these strategies because vanilla buy to lets. Um, HMOs, things like that, you can go out and source specifically for your sourcing clients around them as particular strategies. So it's important to understand what they are, how they work, and why you should maybe consider them. In addition to that, if you want to do joint ventures, these strategies would just be a, a method of really going out and doing those joint ventures. So you could do buy to lets or HMOs or flips within those joint ventures. So even if you've got a smaller budget, I'd look at these strategies, but certainly if you've got a larger budget or certainly anything from say 50,000 upwards, these strategies can be accessible and available for you to consider. So the first key strategy that most investors are aware of is straightforward vanilla buy to let. So this could be a terrace house, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, or it could be an apartment, city centre apartment, or a town apartment of one bedroom, two bedrooms, even studios. All of these can work typically for vanilla buy to lets. Ultimately, it's where you have a property as an asset. You would rent that out to an individual or a couple or a family as one home for that individual or couple or family to rent. Now, vanilla buy to lets can be a great strategy because they're relatively mainstream. They're relatively easy to arrange finance on as long as you obviously achieve the right criteria as an individual or a company if you wanted to finance them as a company. But they are quite mainstream, they're quite vanilla, so they tend to fit most criteria, they tend to fit most locations. They are also way easier to scale. So everything is set up for vanilla buy to let. If you want to use a refurbishment company, a letting agent, most of those companies are structured in a way that is suitable for vanilla buy to let, regardless again of your tenant profile as well, but some specialize in certain tenant profiles. Some will be great for students, some will be great for um, individual professional tenants, some will be great for local housing allowance or families. Depending on the location, there will be a letting agent, a refurbishment company, and other types of experts and power team members that can specifically help you grow a vanilla buy to let portfolio. Now in terms of vanilla buy to let there are some figures and rules of thumb and guides that we typically try and achieve in our portfolios. Now this changes obviously depending on where you are in the country so down south in London for example it might be slightly differently than what it is up north in the northwest where we're based in Manchester but ultimately we try and achieve around 8% gross rental yield for a vanilla buy to let. We'd also try and achieve around 5% per annum growth, so slightly above inflation. And both of those combined should give us a very nice net profit and income on the property that we would hold over a longer period of time. Now, there's certain things that play into this. So if prices are going up in value quite quickly, your yields might drop slightly because rents might not catch up quite as much. Or if you're in an area of very high growth generally, so maybe if you're in London or the South and there's typically quite high growth in those locations, your yields might be slightly lower than those targets. So try and figure out and ultimately understand what your target yields would be. If you're gonna use finance and leverage to fund a project, how much that's gonna cost you, how much money you're gonna have in the deal, and ultimately what your cash flow needs to be from that particular property to understand where your yield should be. But as a rough rule of thumb as a guide, as I said, 8% or so is what we try and target and achieve for our vanilla buy to lets with about 5% per annum growth on the equity. Hope that helps. Not only that, but vanilla buy to let can scale really well as well. So regardless of whether it's a one bedroom apartment or a full apartment block, or whether it's a two bedroom terrace house or a five bedroom family home, vanilla buy to let is a strategy that can work typically across those asset types, across those property types. So it's a great strategy to use to grow at scale. It's usually as well a strategy that can work in any given market. So regardless of what's happening, usually with property prices, it's a property strategy the way you have ongoing tenant and rental demand. So it's a great strategy for that. Next up, there's a strategy called HMOs or houses of multiple occupation. Now there's lots of different things to consider with HMOs and we have a whole range of different uh, content on HMOs specifically on our VIP training and also on our website with free training. So I won't go into the detail of that, more just to give you an overview really of what the strategy is. So HMOs, Houses of Multiple Occupation, effectively is where you're renting out individual rooms within a property to individual tenants. So you may have, for example, a, a large house that's got five bedrooms where an occupant would have their own bedroom and that might be a large bedroom with an ensuite as well but then they would probably share communal areas. They might have a communal bathroom, 
or they might have their own ensuite, as we mentioned, but they'll probably share a, a communal living room, communal outside space, communal corridors, things like that. Now, a HMO is great as a strategy because what it usually achieves over in a vanilla, buy to, uh, a vanilla buy to let is an increase in rental income. So where our targets are maybe 8% for vanilla buy to let on a gross yield, we'd usually achieve around 12 to 15% gross on a HMO. Now there are extra running costs to HMO, so that will reduce your total net income on the property. Typically HMOs, you're looking at covering things like council tax, utility bills. You don't always, it's, it's entirely up to you how you structure it, but that's usually what we see best in the marketplace. That would usually reduce your yields by about 4% or so in any given area. Everything being equal, that's what we'd usually see achieved. So if it's in a good area, works for HMOs, and let's say your gross rental income is 15%, your net rental income is probably gonna be around 11% or so, give or take. So it just gives you a bit of a guide, a bit of an idea, and a bit of a rule of thumb. Not only that, but there is potential benefit for increased uplift as well, in equity and in value of that particular deal. So we spoke before about vanilla buy to lets and about 5% or so a year per annum growth that we try and achieve on our properties. Well, for our HMOs, we might see a slightly higher growth than that. Now, it might not be slightly higher growth um, per year over a period of time, but what we should achieve is a higher increase in value, asset value to that deal from day one when we convert it to a HMO. Now, very often that's because we derive a slightly higher income, a better yield from that property, and that translates to a better overall value of that particular asset. So HMOs compared to vanilla buy to lets can give you a better rental income and they can also give you a better kind of asset value in, in, in effect over a period of time combined with what you do to the property on day one should give you a slightly better property and asset. However, there are downsides to HMOs. They're not typically as easy to finance. Speak to mortgage brokers, get an idea of the lay of the land for what will be available for you. When we're speaking to lenders on a day-to-day -day basis and brokers on a day-to-day -day basis, what we find is obviously the market changes, but generally vanilla buy to lets are much easier to arrange finance for. They are also harder for inexperienced investors, I'd say, to get started with HMOs because you don't necessarily have the experience of dealing with day-to-day um, -day with tenants. Um, it's sometimes often easier to get started with vanilla buy to lets. Banks prefer that, lenders prefer that, um, and it's very often easier to find letting agents for vanilla buy to lets than it is for HMOs. So there is that trade off the potential for slightly higher income, potential for slightly higher equity and asset value and growth, but the trade off is maybe management, trade off is experience, and obviously tenants, things like that. So you can mitigate those risks and you can sometimes pair those two strategies by starting off with a vanilla buy to let and then going into HMOs can be a very good way to overcome that and still put yourself in a good position if you do want to raise finance or you do want to get kind of mortgages. But hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight as to what HMOs um, are and that's houses of multiple occupation. Next up as a strategy, we're gonna be looking at corporate lets or serviced accommodation. Now this is quite an interesting strategy because it's relatively new in its current format. Um, it has been around for a number of years in different kind of ways, shapes or form, but more recently the growth of websites like Airbnb and Booking.com has made serviced accommodation very accessible both for end users and occupiers and also investors and homeowners and if, uh, really landlords that want to rent out their property on a slightly different model. Now there are some downsides to service accommodation. There are things to consider, planning, legislation, health and safety, insurance, there's a whole thing, host of things that kind of come into service accommodation. It's very difficult again to include this in a short video. We do look at that further in our VIP training, but just to give you a bit of an insight in terms of what service accommodation is, is it's primarily meant as a slightly different um, format and structure than maybe a hotel would provide with like one night stay all the way through to what a maybe vanilla buy to let would provide on a six month tenancy. Service accommodation and corporate lets usually fit somewhere in the middle. So you can still rent it to an individual or a family or a couple. Very often corporate lets you would rent to a company. What you'd achieve with that is an increase in a premium rental income. What you have to deliver from that is much more of a service though. You provide a property that's fully furnished, all bills included, effectively somewhere that somebody can turn up just with a bag and settle straight in. Now this is great for people that are maybe visiting a, a city center and want somewhere to stay for a week rather than staying in a hotel for one night um, or having to change rooms in a hotel, let's say if they were staying there for a long period of time. It's also great for companies that maybe need to house um, short-term contractors or employees, or even if they've got maybe an event on and they've got team members coming from across the world or across the country, it's great for that use case. 
Now, serviced accommodation as an income usually provides around 12 to 20 percent um, returns, gross returns, we'd usually say, on those types of properties. That's location specific, so if obviously in London, it's going to be different to what you'd achieve in Leeds. And serviced accommodation works very well on a whole range of properties. It can work as holiday lets, so you might get a country um, house that can work quite well on. Typically though we see most city centre locations do best with this, city centre apartments or city centre townhouses can work very well because you have a, a more transient nature, you have a more kind of um, I suppose buoyant nature, buoyant demand for that type of service, people coming to visit for work, for holidays and um, for short term stays effectively but you have enough demand there to, to maintain it as a, as a business and as an income stream and as a potential um, strategy to use for your property investment. This is a great strategy for increasing your rental income in areas that can be very good, solid locations, and your growth would probably be similar to a straightforward buy to let over a period of time. There's not necessarily an inherent value add by using the property as a service accommodation. It falls back quite quickly to being a straightforward rental. So you still get the benefit of growth. Um, in line should be with vanilla buy to lets, but you get a slightly higher rental income. The trade-off for that is slightly more management, so you just have to find a management company that's going to be specifically set up and structured to manage these properties correctly. Obviously there's a difference in terms of insurance, there's going to be a difference in terms of how you fund and finance that property as well. So there are things to consider, but it can be a great strategy um, to give you a slightly higher rental income if that's what you're looking for and as long as the locations you're considering would be a fit for serviced accommodation. Hope that helps. Another strategy that can work very well is something called recycle your deposit. Now this is where you would buy a property, add value with some form of refurbishment, and then post refurbishment look to refinance that property at its new created value. What that'll allow you to do, or should allow you to do, all things being equal, is pull out the original money that you invest in that property with the refinance, and then use that initial deposit pot to again go on and purchase your next property. That allows you effectively to build um, a bit of momentum and to grow a property portfolio with one, parting, right, one starting pot. If you're not in a situation where you have large funds available on day one that you can just go out and buy a portfolio or create your own portfolio, or you have enough funds on day one to leverage and combine that with maybe mortgage finance to do the same, go out and buy a portfolio or grow a portfolio, then recycling your deposit can be a great way to, to build momentum and to grow that portfolio over time. There's a couple of things to consider on this that will um, make or break this as a potential strategy. So one, how much money you have to start off with on day one. Is that enough to fund the deposit? And is that enough to fund the refurbishment? In a perfect world, you'd have enough money to fund the purchase and the refurbishment. And then you can arrange mainstream finance post refurbishment to pull out your original investment or as much of your original investment as possible to then go on to your next deal. That would be a great scenario to be in. However, if you don't have that, but you have maybe enough for a deposit and you have enough for refurbishment, speak to some mortgage brokers, make sure you get the right mortgage product to do this type of strategy with. You can then go out and find property, add value with a refurbishment, increase the end value. You can maybe buy value as well by negotiating right on day one refinance and pull out as much money on that deal to then go out and buy the next property. Now there is an element of risk with this, with this particular strategy, it does rely on leverage. So you're gonna be increasing the amount of debt you have on those properties. So if you're not comfortable with leverage, it's probably not a good strategy to consider. And um, if you are comfortable with leverage, you still have to consider how much you want to leverage. You don't want to over um, expose yourself on any given deal, but it's a good strategy that can work to grow a portfolio if you're starting off with more limited funds or one deposit pot to kind of get started with. Depending on the area, what we'd usually say is a minimum amount for this would be about 50,000. That gives you enough for a deposit and a refurbishment in most areas of the UK. Certainly if you're in a higher value location, you're gonna want more money than that to kind of get started. And in a perfect world, you want enough funds to buy the property outright fund the refurbishment and then you can refinance on the mainstream cash later on that puts you in a very good scenario hope that helps okay finally as a strategy we're going to be looking at something called flipping or property trading it's also known as but effectively where you're buying and selling property in the middle you're typically adding some form of value with a refurbishment and then you're making your profit on the difference between your buy price and either holding costs reversion costs and your sell price now flipping is a great strategy and it's a great strategy can combine potentially with other strategies as well, which we'll look at slightly um, later on in some of the other training videos. But effectively what it allows you to do is invest in property in a shorter cycle. So rather than a buy and hold that might be three years, five years, 10 years, or even more, 
flipping usually are between six to 12 month projects, so they're shorter time frames. This works great if you're maybe looking at projects in a local area. You like the idea of property, you just want to put some money to use, it can be a great strategy for that. It also works great as joint ventures. So if you're maybe in a situation where you've got funds, but you don't have the time or the skill set or the contacts, um, or effectively the, the ability to go out there, usually because of time, to go out and find and refurbish those properties, you can partner with other companies on a joint venture basis or you can fund those projects. Likewise, you can do joint ventures where if you do have the skill set, if you do have the time, the contacts and the properties, and you work with other people that have the funds, it can be a great kind of um, marriage in that respect. It can be a great kind of match to try and do flipping as a project or a strategy together combined with joint ventures. Now flipping ultimately, what you want to be doing is, is, is creating value at different stages of the process. In a perfect world, you can add value at all three stages, as we mentioned before. Um, and one of the benefits of property is where you can create value in diff three different ways. So you can add value effectively with a refurbishment in the middle part of the process, but at both ends as well, you can also buy right and create value with there. And you can also sell right and create value there. Maybe if you add a different tenant profile, so for example, HMOs, you can create additional value to that asset. Now flipping as a model, what we typically say is a rule of thumb, we try and achieve about 15 to 20% net profit on any flip project. And that's regardless of the length of the project, usually that's a good rule of thumb to give you a bit of a guide. Now some projects will be much shorter than others. Typically we say projects are maybe between nine to 12 months for most type of properties, but certainly if you're looking at a straightforward kind of flip and it's maybe a three bedroom terrace that you're refurbishing and selling on, that shouldn't need to take nine months or certainly 12 months to buy, refurbish and sell. Some of those projects can be done in as short as six months. We've done projects in as short as four months as a bit of an idea, um, but usually nine to 12 months gives you a bit of buffer. Six months is a good guide. And if you're achieving 15 to 20% profit on those deals and you're constantly active with flipping so you can find the properties and you can put those funds to use and you extrapolate that over a period of time, your ROI can be fantastic. So if you're maybe even charging or, or targeting 15% return on each deal and that takes you six months to do a deal if you can do two of those in a year it's going to be a 30 percent roi on those projects so it can be a fantastic return with flipping now the reason why we say 15 to 20 percent is depending on the market if markets are very buoyant prices are increasing it can be harder to find those fantastic deals at those low prices so you might be paying a little bit more for it but you should hopefully achieve that on the back end resale if prices continue to be um, certainly even stable, but if they continue to increase as well. So ideally target around 15 to 20%, that should give you a good kind of indication of property deals that can stack in any given area typically for a flip project. Um, shorter turn time frames can often be the better. You can put the money to use and make a quicker return on your investment. It can be a great way to run those projects. Um, as we said, it's a good strategy as well to combine. So in future videos, we'll look at really how you can now go from maybe one or two properties to get some sort of form of scale and how flipping can kind of play into that kind of potential aspect as well.